I have the great honor of introducing Andy Stevenson, who uh, is doing a four venue round <laughs> retirement talks. So this is a stop on the Grand Tour, and um, but it's his home department. So I should give them the best introduction. But there's four, so it's it's, it's going to be a little scaled back. And uh, Ileana gave such an amazing introduction for Chuck that I, I can't match that. So this is going to be it's going to be short and sweet, and uh, hopefully send Andy off, you know, feeling the warm love of his department and, uh, and 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 the appropriate honors. So he's been here for I think I counted 41 years. Is that your count? So started off in 1978 as an assistant professor, coming from a PhD and postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan. <coughs> no post on. No post. Oh, okay. That's I, sorry. <laughs> you came straight from the university. <laughs> uh, he was an associate professor for only two, three years, and then they saw the light and pushed him up to full prof uh, pretty promptly. And in 2011, he became a distinguished professor. And that came with uh, strings attached. They made him be the associate dean for research in the College of Science and uh, director of the Office of Innovation, where he really sunk his teeth in and did great things. Um, so I asked Andy, you know, I've got to introduce you. What is it that you'd really like to, to hear here? What should I not miss? And he says, in his you know, wonderful folksy way that Andy has, he says, well, you know, you know baseball, right? And he and I have talked baseball lots of times over the years. Sure, sure. He says, well, you know, in baseball, they consider somebody a five-tool player. And I'm like, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, my uncle was a scout for the Baltimore Orioles, by the way. He's in the uh, Hall of Fame, not himself, but because he famously said Mariano Rivera needs to develop another pitch. <laughs> you won't make it. Anyway. In baseball, if you're a five-tool player, you've got good running speed, so you can steal bases, strong throwing arm, you can throw people out, you can hit for average, you can hit for power, that means home runs, and you can field your position. You're a good defensive player. So, you know, somebody who can do it all, and, and those don't come along very often. Now, if you're a pitcher, these metrics would change a little bit. If you're an academic, they change even more. <laughs> so when you get to look in the mirror, <laughs> and so we do the scouting report and have a look. And so in academia, if you're a five-tool academic, you need to be strong in research, in teaching, in mentoring, in leadership, and in outreach. So let's let's check the scouting report. So back in 2002, he was on the list of most highly cited researchers in ecology. And these things change over the years, but to ever be on it once, you're doing great. Right? So you're one of the international leaders in, you know, this is not a small sub-discipline. So make that list is very special. So we'll check that box. Teaching, he's gotten, uh, he's received uh, teaching awards for both undergraduate and graduate teaching. That measures up pretty well. Mentoring, student success. Well, this needs a whole other slide. So I'm just showing you the places where his uh, grad students and postdocs, and these are not the private sector ones, these are just working in academia and museums, uh, where they have landed, and uh, many of them are full professors. There's a department chair at the University of Connecticut here, uh, directors of, of research divisions and museums. There's, I think, seven different countries represented here, and eight if you count Texas. <laughs> and some of these students have been influential in my career, so uh, this is this has really affected me. And Andy's one of the people who brought me here, so I, I need to nod that debt of gratitude to Andy. Okay, so uh, leadership. Um, he's on the board of directors of the Hobie Everly Telescope, of all things. <laughs> Right, so that's that's real versatility there, and that's just I could have put put many different things on there, but I thought that would spice this up a little. And outreach, uh, directing the Ecos Office for Innovation, and I realized as I was thinking about this, I really should have put he was instrumental in establishing the Arboret Arboretum, which uh, if you live in this town and you go to the Arboretum, which an awful lot of us do, 
um, that's a real lasting impact and something that we should all be thanking Andy for for generations to come. So I'll just end with saying there's more and that sort of thing if, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Which is an Andyism or two Andyisms. One usually follows the other. Uh, so if he can get through this talk without saying that, uh, it'll be a surprise. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, in my uh, 41 years here at Penn State, it's, uh, I've noticed that the vast majority of undergraduates who come into the biology department come in with the hope and dream of being botanists. However, <laughs> however, sometime during their freshman year, they run into alternation of generations. And they realize they just don't have the right stuff to be a botanist. <laughs> and, and they go on to lead rather meaningless and trivial lives as physicians, MDs, neuroscientists, and of course the worst of them become disease ecologists. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, here, here's your last chance to, uh, to really become educated and uh, learn all about alternation of generations. Okay. So, uh, here, uh, I'm trying to summarize uh, difference between a microgametophyte and sperm. Here we have four mammals that produce sperm. And you can think of animal sperm as being like one of those little rubber ducks that you play with in the bathtub. Dad winds it up, he puts in ATP and stuff, and then it flaps its way to the other end of the tub. Okay? <laughs> that is animal sperm. You don't have any transcription or translation or no growth or anything. Okay? Now, microgametophyte. Now, here we have a bee comes in and deposits a massive load of pollen onto the stigma of this flower. You can see these pollen grains have germinated and they have grown. Microgametophytes are multicellular organisms. They consist of one body cell, one vegetative cell, and uh, sometime during this growth, the generative cell divides into two sperm cells. So it's one body cell, two sperm cells. And this actually grows. It grows from the stigmatic surface all the way down into the ovules and achieves fertilization. The, uh, now, for the life so it's a stage in the life cycle of this plant. However, it's an unusual stage in the life cycle because it's interacting throughout almost its entire life with its mother-in-law, okay? And so 
to grow down from the stigmatic surface to the ovules, mom is making it transcribe and translate a massive portion of its genome. Okay? She's not making it easy to get to her ovules. Okay. So this race to the ovules is of great evolutionary importance. From the male perspective, the winners get their genes into the next generation, the losers do not. So expect selection for increased pollen competitive ability. And that's, you know, competition in terms of being able to sprint rapidly. There may also, and there's some indication that, uh, that it's kind of like a Ben-Hur or the chariot race where they're bumping into each other and trying to interfere with one another also. Okay. From the female perspective, pollen donors are not equal in quality. They differ in vigor, uh, such as uh, some pollen donors are good at taking nutrients up from the soil, some are resistant to diseases and things of that sort. So there's variation among individuals, uh, donor plants out there. Uh, they di and they differ in relatedness to the uh, maternal sporophyte, the, the maternal 2N plant. Uh, the genotypes of microgametophytes differ one to the other even among those from the same pollen donors because of independent assortment, that sort of thing, epigenetic uh, markings. So you expect the maternal sporophyte, this tissue through which these pollen tubes are growing, to influence the outcome of the uh, pollen tube race. Okay. So what we have here is uh, electron microgrower, SEM, of uh, pollen developing in an anther of uh, uh, cucurbita, zucchini. Okay. And these are the uh, microspores, the developing pollen grains. And these, uh, this tissue around the outside is called the tapetum. And this is really a nurse cell. It's providing resources to these pollen grains. Okay, so the tapetum, right before the pollen grains are ready to be shed, it sort of secretes itself to death. And it puts onto this coating over the outside of the pollen grain. These, it dresses this pollen grain for success. There's proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, various phenolic compounds uh, and on the outside of the pollen grain. And these are all diploid in nature. They're coming from the pollen producing parent. Okay, so these are 2N proteins uh, that are coming from there. There's a few proteins that are produced by the microgametophyte that's secreted out into the pollen coating also. But these are really important in terms of pollen stigma interactions. Okay, now on the inside of the pollen grain, on the inside of the pollen grain, there's nutrient and energy storage products, things like phytic acid, phosphorus storage compounds, for example. There are uh, uh, starch, that can be metabolized into ATP rapidly. There's uh, lipids and things of that sort. There's also 22 to 24,000 unique messenger RNAs that are gametophytic in origin, that are expressed by the genome of the microgametophyte. And in addition, this pollen grain is loaded with enzymes that are microgametophytic in origin. So the stuff on the inside, all of the genetic stuff on the inside, the uh, uh, messenger RNAs and enzymes, they're from the microgametophyte. There's some nutrient energy and uh, storage products that have come from the tapetum early in development. 
Okay. So, about 60, if you look, you say 22 to 24,000 genes. Well, if you were to take a leaf and look, how many unique messenger RNAs are produced by that leaf in its life? It'd be about 30,000. Okay? So, about two-thirds, so in order to make that tiny little track from the stigmatic surface to the ovules requires two-thirds of the genes to be expressed that you might find in a leaf tissue throughout its lifetime. And that's for the development of the leaf, for the photosynthesis, for the whole shooting match. <laughs> About 5 to 10 percent of these genes that are expressed by the microgametophyte are unique, are only expressed in the microgametophyte. The other 90, 95 percent are expressed during both stages of the life cycle. So they're expressed uh, by the diploid resulting offspring would express those genes also. Uh, Consequently, selection on the microgametophyte can alter sporophyte or diploid performance. Okay? So, there you go. You get pollen grains that land on a stigma. Uh, upon germination, they produce a burst of uh, compounds that are converted to ethylene and it hastens the stigmatic surface, the uh, degeneration of the stigmatic surface. And that's important because bacteria, fungi, that sort of thing, they also want to grow down through the style and achieve, and uh, get into the next generation vertical. Okay. Uh, the things on that, remember these pollen grains are dressed for success, so when they land on a stigmatic surface, the stigma recognizes and uh, uh, pollen grains from their own species and rejects pollen and spores from other species. You get rapid rehydration. There's also cutenases and things like that in the uh, pollen coat. Uh, pectinases and other enzymes that digest their way into the stig through the stigmatic surface and in some species with uh, uh, they recognize self and cross pollen. Okay. So initially during this initial stage you get rather slow for pollen growth uh, and it's during this time that all of the phosphorus that's in the storage in the pollen grain, it's used up and converted into uh, membranes and things of that sort. The energy products, the lipids and starches get used up. So they're early on, it's autotrophic, the growth. It's dependent upon stored reserves. Okay. And uh, so you can think of these as like a... Uh, uh, racing down to this physical constriction uh, where it constricts from stigmatic tissue to transmitting tissue which is biochemically developmentally and structurally distinct at this time the generative cell divides into two sperm cells in most plants uh, okay okay so then grows down, gets into the ovary, and fertilizes an ovule, these pollen tubes. You get very rapid heterotrophic uh, growth. That is, in order for these pollen tubes to grow down through the style, they have to take resources in for mom. They have to take in resources uh, uh, that, that provide energy, that uh, are the building blocks for laying down uh, uh, cell membranes and so on and so forth. All of those resources are coming from mom. Now mom doesn't make it easy. She, you know, these pollen tubes need ATP. But she doesn't, you know, give them ATP. She makes them deglycosylate proteins and things of that sort in order to get 
some uh, blue coats. She, uh, she gives them various building blocks. She's making sure that these pollen tubes are running through all the biochemical pathways and that sort of thing because one of those tubes is going to fertilize the globule <coughs> and she's going to have to pay for it. Seeds are expensive to make. Fruits are expensive to make. Okay? So, and this is the only part that I, uh, the rest of it is, uh, you'll see at the end that uh, the various grad students and postdocs and collaborators that assisted with, with the data in this. Uh, but this is the only data I contributed in my whole talk, this uh, <laughs> electron micrograph. It may not work anymore because none of you remember when people used to smoke, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the humor may be lost. So, uh, you saw it on TV. You saw it on TV. <laughs> After 11 at night. <laughs> okay. Which pollen grains win the race to the ovules? Okay. Well, that's a question I asked back in the early 80s. Which of these pollen grains are making it there? Well, could be the uh, phenotype of the paternal sporophyte, the paternal diploid that made the pollen grains. Okay, phenotype of course is determined by the environment, by the genotype, which is both additive and non-additive genetic variation, and by interactions between the genotype and the environment. It could also be due to the microgametophyte, genes expressed only in the microgametophyte, and genes expressed during both the microgametophytic and the sporophytic stages of the life cycle during both the one and then two end stages of the life cycle. Okay, we'll look at the environment first. And we did this uh, experiment out at the Ag Station where we grew isogenic inbred lines of zucchini. And the thing that differed between them is that they either had yellow ovaries, the zucchini, you call them summer squash, or they had green ovaries, which we call zucchini. Okay, but these were. And uh, then we grew them on high phosphorus soil and low phosphorus so soil. We recorded the number of male and female flowers, pollen per male flower, phosphorus concentration in the pollen, pollen size. But then we did some pollen competition experiments. Okay. And what we did is we placed yellow pollen. 50-50 mixtures of yellow pollen, pollen from yellow ovary plants and uh, pollen from green ovary plants onto the green zucchini, okay? And then we did this lots of times, took 50 seeds per fruit and scored paternity. We also did the uh, green ovary from high phosphorus fields and yellow from low phosphorus fields. And what we found is that high phosphorus, not surprisingly, that's why farmers would add phosphorus to the soil. You get more male and female flowers. Uh, perhaps it, you know, farmers don't do it because the, uh, you find more pollen per male flower and you uh, we found that it increased the phosphorus concentration in pollen by 8% and the pollen volume increased by 6%. But when we did the pollen competition study, we found that the uh, high P uh, pollen sired significantly more of the seeds than you would expect by chance alone. We scored, I'm trying to remember, but it was in the area of like 4,000 seeds they're easy to just plant them and then say whether they have a green or yellow ovary. You know, that makes it pretty easy. Okay, growing conditions, soil nutrients affected the ability of the paternal sporophyte to provision its pollen. Differences in pollen size associated with differences in pollen performance. 
and differences in pollen performance are due to an environmental effect on, on the paternal uh, sporophyte. This isn't due to anything genetic. Dad happened to be living in a spot that had a lot of phosphorus, and consequently, Dad could donate a lot to his pollen. Okay? And remember, during that autotrophic growth phase, the ability to uh, lay down uh, cell membrane is particularly important. Okay. So, the environment that Dad's growing in influences the speed of pollen to grow. Next, let's look at some non-additive genetic variation. And again, we're back to using uh, wild uh, squash here. And uh, it's a uh, monoecious vine, that is, it has separate male and female flowers on the same plant. Uh, it produces one flower every time it grows a leaf, it'll produce a flower. Another leaf, another flower. The flower could be male or female. Uh, Individual flowers last for only one morning, and uh, it's the wild progenitor of the cultivated squashes. Okay, so what we did is we took these this wild squash, and we produced self progeny on one fruit, and then another fruit, another branch, or farther out on the branch, we produced outcross progeny, and then we grew these progeny and we recorded male and female flowers, pollen per male flower, pollen size, and we did a pollen competition experiment. And again, the pollen competition experiment was a variation on what we did before, 50-50 mixture, except this time we used zucchini uh, tester line, which was also the pollen from the recipients, and we used pollen from an inbred wild gourd. Tester line versus outbred wild gourd, and we scored the progeny. Uh, what we found is that uh, inbred, uh, inbreeding decreased male and female flower number, not surprisingly, inbreeding depression. Uh, it decreased pollen per male flower, impacted pollen volume by 9%, and then when we looked at in vitro uh, pollen tube growth, we found that the uh, pollen from the outcross plants germinated and grew faster in vitro. But the pollen competition experiment, what we found is about 50-50 mixture when we took the tester line versus the self taxana, but when we used outcross uh, wild gourd, they sired significantly more seeds than the tester line. So, inbreeding affected the ability of the pollen producing parent to provision its pollen. Inbreeding depression affected the performance of the microgametophyte, and the differences in pollen performance are due to non-additive genetic effects on the paternal sporophyte. Not, it's not a genetic, uh, not an additive genetic differences. Uh, in, because inbreeding increases homozygosity uh, of the paternal sporophyte and exposes deleterious recessives, consequently, and decreases the number of overdominant loci, which decreases the ability of the plant to donate to its offspring, donate resources to its pollen. But it doesn't really alter allele frequencies, so it's a non-additive genetic variation. Okay, so now let's look at some additive, the impacts of additive genetic variation. And here again, we're still talking about the pollen producing parent, the phenotype of the paternal sporophyte. Okay, again, we're working with uh, wild gourds, and uh, uh, these are three people uh, Danielle Weekland, uh, Kayla Nowak, and uh, uh, Jackie Hart, who did this work. Okay, well, 
as you might imagine, uh, wild boars have a variety of herbivores, including several generalist aphids that attack the uh, uh, squash, wild squash. But most importantly, these aphids are vectors of zucchini yellow mosaic virus, watermelon mosaic virus, and cucumber mosaic virus. Uh, this one is uh, uh, zucchini yellow, this is watermelon, this is uh, cucumber mosaic virus, and growers hate this. Growers hate these because while it just, it doesn't kill the plants, it slows their growth and reproduction, but it makes all the fruits unmarketable because nobody goes out and buys a squash fruit that has, uh, has uh, that looks ugly. Okay. Consequently, in uh, the early to mid 90s, plant, uh, most, you may not know this, most of the summer squash and zucchini that you buy in grocery stores uh, during the summer here, and actually during the winter too, are uh, transgenic. And what, what they have is a promoter and then a little piece of the coat protein from watermelon mosaic virus, then a, a reporter gene, NPT2, uh, neomycin phosphotransferase, uh, and then a piece of the zucchini yellow mosaic virus, a coat protein, and a piece of the cucumber uh, coat protein. And this acts as interference RNA. So when a virus attacks these plants, the piece of the coat protein that's being read off all the time acts as interference RNA and keeps the plant from getting disease. Okay, so what we did is we took uh, transgenic squash and we crossed it to Cucurbita texana, Cucurbita papo subspecies texana. It's the same biological species. And uh, much to my surprise, after inquiring in that, I didn't need any permit to do this because it was deregulated for cucurbit paper. So uh, uh, I crossed it, and then we made, uh, by back crossing it to the wild gourd parent, we made Aplons and then eventually up to Bat Cross 9 generation. And Bat Cross 9, basically, when you're up at Bat Cross 7, 8, 9, when you're out that far, you basically have just a wild gourd with the transgene in it. Because the frequency of the cultivated genes decreases by 50% in every generation. So the F1 has 50% cultivated. The F2 has 25, 12 and a half, six and a quarter, help me out here, 3%, one and a half, you know, down like that. Okay. Transgenic, these transgenic uh, plants were uh, hemizygous for the transgene, the virus resistant transgene, VRT. And we could determine which of our plants had the virus resistant transgene just by taking a little piece of the uh, uh, leaf and grinding it up and doing uh, ELISA tests on them for the neomyosin phosphotransferase reporter gene. So we could determine which ones were transgenic and which ones weren't. So from any given fruit, we had half of the progeny were transgenic, the other half were not. Okay, we did this for 20 families, and we used a double antibody sandwich of ELISA. Okay, so from 2006 to 2008 out at Rock Springs, out at the Ag Station, we had four replicate fields, uh, 0.4 hectare fields. 0.4 hectares is one acre. Oh. Okay, we had 180 plants in each field from five families. There were 90 wild type plants in the field, 45 transgenic intragrassives, in this case, 
and uh, 45 uh, non-transgenic intragrasses. And we measured flower and fruit production and monitored disease status for all of the viral diseases plus the bacterial disease that was in circulation. And what I want to show you here is that the plants with the virus resistant transgene basically did not get uh, any of the virus diseases. Uh, whereas the other plants in each of the year had, uh, when the virus disease came in, it rapidly spread through the susceptible plants. Okay. Well, not surprisingly, we found higher fitness for the transgenic plants. There are direct effects of the uh, transgene on fitness in the presence of the virus. Uh, uh, they, uh, the, the transgenic plants produce more male flowers, more fruits, uh, but there was no difference between the wild type and the non-transgenic infographics. Okay. What we did here is we collected two fruits from each non-transgenic plant in our fields, okay, from each of the uh, non-transgenic plants. And we pulled the seeds from these fruits, and we randomly germinated 500 seeds per field and tested for the presence of the transgene in the progeny. Okay. Well, if there was random fertilization, we expected that 12, 12 and a half percent of the progeny would be would contain the transgene because they were 25 percent of the plants we put in each field, and it was hemizygous. So we expected. However, we'd also recorded increased flower and pollen production per flower. If you calculate all that in. We expected 19% of the seeds to be transgenic, assuming random fertilization. Well, in each of the three years, we found more than 25% of the seeds have the transgene. So what happened is the transgene increased in frequency dramatically from one generation to the next. Okay, if we look at in vitro pollen tube growth, if you look over here at the virus-free plants, the pollen tube growth was much greater, significantly greater, than in heavily infected plants. Okay, and it decreased with the amount of virus load in the plants. The in vitro pollen tube growth rate, if you germinate and grow pollen in vitro. Of course, we didn't run it just do that, we had to do our pollen competition experiment. Again, a tester line, again, with pollen from an infected wild gourd. Tester line versus healthy, took them all, let the fertilization occur, and scored the progeny. What we found is that when we used healthy wild gourds uh, in competition with uh, pollen from the cultivated squash, we found that the, uh, uh, that the cultivated squash sired about 59% of the seeds. When we used pollen from an infected wild gourd, we found that pollen fertilized about two-thirds of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, zucchini pollen sired about two-thirds of the seeds. So what happens is, is that the pollen from infected plants has, uh, uh, is growing more slowly, probably because dad isn't able to uh, contribute as much to the pollen grains, not as able to put as much nitrogen and phosphorus and, and energy storage products in there, into its pollen. So here, Pollen performance is associated with a heritable trait of the paternal donor plant, the pollen donor plant. In this case, it's uh, uh, pathogen resistance. Uh, 
pollen selection, this is weird. You actually get pollen selection occurring that's actually acting on genes that are not even expressed in the microgametophyte. Because dad is affecting what's stored in the pollen grains, okay? But it's not a gene that's expressed by the microgametophyte itself. So this can host, uh, hasten the erosion of genetic variation, or it could maintain genetic variation if there's a cost associated with resistance to pathogens. Okay, so from this initial part, the outcome of pollen competition, this is male-male competition, in plants is based on the phenotype of the diploid parent, just like in, uh, in these peacocks, the phenotype of the diploid parent. Females are choosing based on the phenotype of the parent, uh, of, the, of the male, okay? Healthy, big, showy males sire more baby peacocks, peahens, whatever it's called, okay. Now let's look at genes that are expressed only in the microgametophyte. And for this work, this is a lean Valdivius work, and uh, this is going to be pretty uh, embarrassing because Dan's going to be correcting me throughout this part of the talk. And it was done in collaboration with Dan Cosgrove. Uh, and she was working on maize uh, and looking at pollen tube growth there. And expansins are cell wall loosening proteins first identified in young cucumber seedlings and later in other plant tissues. Uh, they, uh, they allow the uh, cell wall to relax and extend and uh, it weakens the linkage between the cellulose microfibrils I'm not sure if this mechanism is still unknown. Probably Dan's got this nailed down now. Allowing extension of the cell wall. And it's involved, and expansions are involved in many aspects of plant growth and development. Okay, it's part of a super family of cell wall loosening proteins, these expansions. But part of this is the expansion B uh, expansions. Uh, there are a lot of them are involved in vegetative growth, but there's some called the grass group one pollen allergens. And if you look at grass pollen, up to 10% of the protein that's in a grass pollen is this expansion, is this uh, group one pollen uh, allergen expansion up to 10%. Now remember, there's 23,000 different genes being expressed in these pollen grains, but 10% of it, that's a lot, is uh, one protein, or could be up to 10%. It also causes hay fever and seasonal asthma in 400 million people, about 20% of the people in North America. Uh, it's uh, made by the microgametophyte, and it's expressed only in pollen. Well, Dan and Aline uh, obtained these transposon insertional mutants from hy uh, Pioneer Hybrid, which basically limited the expression of this pollen expansion. Okay, and they, we created three types of plants. The wild type, expansion, the heterozygote, and the homozygous uh, with, uh, with homozygote with the uh, transposon insertion. And we assess pollen viability and in vitro pollen performance for each type of plant. So, when we looked at pollen viability, the pollen from the double mutant the heterozygote and the wild type all had just under 80% viable pollen. 80% of the pollen produced was viable. If we looked at the average pollen tube, growth, uh, tube length, 
in uh, when we grew it in vitro. No significant differences. This is probably some hybrid vigor that you get in the adult plants that are capable of uh, donating more resources. But, okay. But we also assess in vivo pollen performance from the wild type and the double mutant. And what we did is we performed these pollinations on the silks of plants. And then we counted the number of pollen tubes 10 centimeters down at eight hours after pollination. We also looked at pollen tubes in ovules at 24 hours after pollination. And what we found is if you looked eight hours later, 10 centimeters down on the silks, you see that there's like two and a half pollen tubes already down each silk by uh, eight hours after fertilization, after pollination. But there's very few pollen tubes, less than one, if you use the double mutant. We looked at 24 hours post-pollination. The pollen from the wild type following pollination using wild type pollen, about 39% of the ovules were fertilized by 30 hours, uh, but none were fertilized using the double mutant. 30 hours after pollination, 97.5% uh, of the ovules uh, uh, following uh, wild type pollination, and only 20% of the mutant types were fertilized. So, the mutant pollen is growing more slowly in the cells. Okay, so then what we did is we assessed in vivo performance from pollen from the heterozygous plants. And what we did is we took the silks, we cut them off so they're all the same length, and we put the pollen in tiny little salt shakers and we sprinkled it over the top. We either placed 50, 100, 250, or 500 microliters of pollen from the heterozygous plants onto silks of the wild type. Okay? And then we scored the progeny for the transposon. Well, when we put only 50 microliters, sprinkled 50 microliters over the thing. We got about half of the ovules were fertilized by the transposon, half by the uh, wild type pollen. When we did 100, we got basically the same 50-50. But when we used 250 uh, microliters of pollen, the frequency of the transposon in the progeny dropped to about 25% and dropped down to just uh, like two or three percent when we use 500 microliters of the uh, pollen. Well, so with the small pollen loads, the 50 and 100 microliters, there was little or no pollen competition for access to the ovules. Both the fast and the slow growing pollen tubes achieved fertilization. But when we used large pollen loads, there was intense pollen competition uh, for access to the ovules, and only the fastest growing pollen tubes achieved fertilization. So, our conclusion is, is that the, uh, this expansion B1 affects pollen tube growth rates uh, in vivo, but not in vitro. This suggests that this expansion acts on the walls of the silk and not on the pollen itself. So what this is, it's going in and loosening. It's helping to pave the way. I could make a bad joke about lubricants here, but I won't. <laughs> uh, so what we have here is a Darwin the term intrasexual selection as exaggerated male traits. 
that allow some males to defeat other males and gain access to females, such as the antlers of antelope or red deer or something of that sort. And th these traits have no beneficial effect on survivorship, no primary sexual function, and they function only to gain access to females via male-male competition. I'd like to argue that expansion is an example of botanical machismo, okay? What we have here is something that has no effect. The, the viability of the pollen was the same. It had no effect on the performance of the progeny. Once they were fertilized, they could still achieve fertilization, could still grow, that sort of thing. But, and it's present, it's 10%. It's an exaggerated trait. It's up to 10% of the total protein. Okay. So, now let's look at genes expressed by both the microgametophyte and the sporophyte. Remember, we got uh, 22, 23, 24,000 different genes being expressed by pollen. 90% or 90% or more are also expressed during the diploid stage of the life cycle. So we went back to the wild gourds to do this work and we did more pollen competition studies. If genes expressed by pollen determine pollen to growth rates, then there should be a correlation between pollen tube growth rate and progeny vigor because of the uh, huge overlap in gene expression between the pollen and the resulting sporophyte. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, okay. So on large pollen loads, only the fastest pollen tubes uh, fertilize the ovules. Small pollen loads, both the fast and the slow tubes fertilize the ovules. And this makes two predictions. One is that the progeny from the large pollen loads will be more vigorous than the progeny from the small uh, pollen loads. And it also predicts that the progeny will be less variable from large pollen loads because you only have fast, where you have both fast and slow growing, achieving fertilization following uh, small pollen loads. Okay, so what we did is we collected pollen from plants, cross pollen, okay? And we took some of that cross pollen, made a small load on one flower on the same plant, and a large pollen load we put onto the flower of an, another female flower on that same plant. So it's from the same pool of pollen, okay? Large and small loads. And we repeated this using different pools of pollen for different females and things of that sort. And we let the fruits mature. We uh, then germinated the progeny and grew them. In the greenhouse, what we found is that the seeds, this is high pollen competition, but large pollen load, small pollen load, uh, uh, the seeds germinated faster from the uh, large pollen loads. They uh, grew faster uh, in terms of stem circumference, number of leaves at harvest, dry weight, that's a dry weight at 30 days. So these grew faster in the greenhouse. And they were significantly less variable, even in our crappy greenhouses. <laughs> okay. Well, then we took these and we put them out in the field. And uh, we found that the progeny from the large pollen loads germinated significantly faster, produced more male and female flowers, produced more mature fruits, produced fruits with more mature seeds than the progeny from the small pollen loads. Okay. If you look at in vitro pollen tube growth, we did this over two years we found that the progeny from the large pollen loads, their pollen tubes grew faster in vitro in uh, 94. This was 30 minutes of in vitro growth. This was 20 minutes of in vitro growth the next year. 
but we found the, exactly the same pattern. These pollen grains from large pollen loads grew faster in vitro. Okay, does in vitro uh, performance equal in vivo? We go back, we do the pollen mixture experiments, and we found that uh, significantly more of the seeds in competition were sired by uh, progeny from large pollen loads than when, when the pollen came from progeny that were produced from small pollen loads. Uh, under competitive conditions. The resulting progeny, uh, the progeny resulting from large pollinated uh, pollen loads germinated faster, grew faster, produced more flowers, fruits, and seeds than progeny from the small pollen loads. Selection for fast growing pollen also produced vigorous offspring. Due, we think, to the overlap in gene expression between the two stages of the life cycle. The pollen from progeny produced from large pollen loads grew faster in vitro, sired more seeds under conditions of pollen competition in vivo. Uh, than the pollen from progeny produced by small pollen loads. Selection for fast growing pollen produced progeny with faster growing pollen. A response to selection is de facto evidence that the trait has a genetic basis. Okay. So, we also did, I, I don't have time to go into this, but we also wanted to know whether mom was hindering the growth of self-pollen tubes on plants that, that were, have no genetic incompatibility system or it's broken down or something of that sort. So we did a whole bunch of these kind of studies where we made a pollination on the stigma, then we cut the style off right above the ovary, and we just counted the tubes, how long it took for tubes to emerge from the bottom of the style. We did this, and in many species, Self-pollen is handicapped in its growth down through the style. Okay, so some conclusions. When large pollen loads consisting of pollen from several donors are deposited onto a stigma, selection during the autotrophic growth phase, this initial phase, is based in part on the phenotype, uh, the ability to provision pollen, of the paternal diploid plant, the pollen donor. Uh, provisioning is determined by uh, paternal genotype, the environment, and genotype by environment interactions. You can select for genes this way that aren't even expressed in the pollen grains. This is analogous to sexual selection in animals. Mating occurs with the healthiest, most resource-rich males. Uh, 23,000 genes are expressed in the pollen genome. About 10% or less are expressed only in pollen. Talk about a pollen-specific group one pollen allergen has no effect on viability or in vitro pollen tube growth, but does affect uh, the outcome of pollen competition for the ovules. This is analogous, I argue, to the antlers of red deer or antelope or something of that sort. It's an exaggerated trait that has no beneficial effect on viability, but big effect on male-male competition. Okay, so when you uh, look at the stigma of a plant and you say, why would mom want to collect all that pollen because she's only got 50 ovules or something like that, and there might be 2,000 pollen grains on the stick. Why would the landing platform for these pollen grains be so big? Well, because there's a lot of sorting out that's beneficial to the plant as those pollen grains germinate and go down through the style. Okay. So, now, all of this makes sense. It's important to the male, it's important to the female, and it's of great evolutionary importance. It has direct evolutionary uh, impact. 
Okay. And these are the people who uh, did the, the work and put in the thought on these projects. Uh, Jim Windsor, Consuelo de Moreas, uh, Dan Cosgrove, uh, Matt Ferrari, uh, Mark Mesker, uh, some postdocs, Steve Travers, Val Lindu, Carl Schlichting, grad students, Oscar Rocha, Mauricio Quesada, a whole bunch of people here. I also published 50 more, I think I'm up to 52 or three papers now that were co-authored with undergraduates. Many of them participated in the work you saw today. I listed, I showed uh, Krista Bowman, she was one of them uh, here. And uh, thank you very much. So you, you experimentally demonstrate that large column loads lead to high levels of selection, but what, what is the natural in the field column load? Uh, with, I've gone down to uh, Mexico to, uh, between uh, Puerto Vallarta and, uh, uh, and Chamao, okay, collected uh, stigmas from tons of different uh, uh, wild gourds. There it's cucurbitar, here it's sperma, but it's cross-compatible with Texana. It's, same biological species, just a different name down there. And, uh, and we found that the vast majority of flowers have way more pollen grains deposited onto the stigma than are necessary to fertilize all the ovules. You can take these stigmas, put them in a heavy acid uh, for that, and it, it eats up all the stigmatic surface and all of that, and leaves you with a little pile of pollen at the bottom and then you count that. So and, is that... And so this is wild, this, you know, now I'm not sure this is a pristine area or not, <laughs> but, uh, but I think the, uh, the typical situation would be that you have far more pollen grains deposited onto the stigma than you have obvious to fertilize. Is it that all of that is potentially compatible with that stigma, or is there a whole uh, that's that's a real good question. Or all of the pollen grain, it does it have pollen from multiple species on there, and that sort of, and that could very well be the case. You can't. It's just counting pollen on stigmas in, in the sort of population level that you need is pretty laborious work. Now, out at the ag station, we always get large pollen loads. Unless you put a bag over the flower and pull it off, do your control pollination with the bag back on. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just one comment. Basically, uh, I was an undergrad here in 78, 79. <laughs> yeah, in, in biology. Um, and uh, I did take advantage of biology. No, good for you. Um, but I, I, just a quick question are, are endophytes? Can be found in uh, help me out, somebody. Do we have endophytes and pollen gra grains and pollen tubes? Okay. I I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Declining population density of pollinators, you'd see a general decrease in plant fitness. Has anybody investigated that and found that result? Well, certainly they've uh, investigated uh, pollinator decline in natural habitats ranging from Costa Rica to the Arctic. That's been demonstrated. Decline in uh, vigor and general fitness of uh, uh, plants and populations with so much varying. It would be hard to say it's due to lack of pollen competition. But, but let's take the intermediate step. Has anybody shown a general decrease in, in pollen loads um, stigmas that, that could potentially create such an effect? Uh, I think the only piece of data that I've seen with that is by uh, Oscar Rocha, who collected, uh, he, he was working with two, uh, 
what's the uh, uh, Costa Rican tree that's little ears? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, the national tree. Is, yeah. Uh, well, those are big ears. So. Yeah, big ears, yeah. The Bamba case. Yeah, it's in the Bamba. So he, that's the only study I've seen. And he's shown that in habitats where there's been recorded uh, precipitous declines in pollinator populations that you get declines in uh, pollen loads on stigmas. There's, there's some work in orchids as well. What? There's some work in orchids as well. Ah, some work in orchids as well. That's it. That orchids would be a good one to do because of the pollinia. Yeah. I really like the expansion story and the argument that it's uh, like the antler. And one of the things about that sort of male male competition, it can lead to runaway craziness, right? Like the Irish elk where they could barely hold their heads up and you know, these rams with these incredibly solid skulls. And yeah. So I'd be really interested to, I don't know whether you guys have tried fiddling with the dose of these expansions. You, you said there was 10% of the cells full of them, but you know, is 12% crippling, is 15% crippling? Because there should be strong selection for more and more expansions. So there must be something that puts a bound on that. Yeah, I would assume that the, the trade-off is between the number of pollen grains you can make and the, uh, and the amount of protein you put in it for this purpose. So I would think if you, say, increase to 12%, you're getting a 20% uh, you know, a, a reduction in total pollen that you can produce because it's, it's nitrogen and phosphorus mm -hmm. that, that's the expensive stuff. And uh, so I would imagine that you'd have to look for pollen uh, protein versus pollen grain number trade-offs. But to my knowledge, nobody's ever done that. So the experiment you're suggesting is maybe engineer the pollen so it's producing two or three or four times more and yeah. see if it starts to get deleterious in yeah. terms of fitness or some oh, other traits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so no one's done that, no. I just sort of think of the Irish elk equivalent here. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the 10% is the Irish elk. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if it passed USDA. <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna quadruple the amount of pollen allergen that's <laughs> floating around on these wind pollinated species. Yeah. 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 But, you know, expansions aren't the only thing that are, are necessary. I mean, there's other enzymes. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> There should be a down 22,999. So there's something like a, a dozen of these genes uh -huh. in, in maize that are all just turned on right at this period of time. So the so one of the one of the ways the pollen makes so many so much of this expansion is by gene duplication. So it's like a, the RNA uh, yeah, yeah. gene story on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so you mentioned that the, the width of the stigma yeah. is important for, for the sorting world. The length of the style from the first slide, you have this very long uh, style, right? Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, is, is that important? And if so, I mean, the, the, does that help the sorting from the plant perspective? Yeah. And if so, isn't that important for then for selection of traits that have to do with pollination with animals that have long beaks of some sort or long mouth parts. Is that, I mean, have you yeah. studied? Yeah, yeah. if you or? have long tubular flowers, you have long styles and that sort of thing. And actually, uh, uh, Steve yeah. Roberts here, uh, my postdoc, worked with Cat and uh, have a modeling paper out on how it can impact uh, sorting uh, as you increase style length and things of that sort. Uh, but, but there has been, uh, David Mulcahy in the early 80s uh, that you masked did this real, there's a uh, Dianthus, I think it is, has a stigma that's very elongated. And when he put pollen grains out at the tip of the stigma versus down right before it goes into the style, he found that there was better, greater sorting of the pollen grains if, if he put it out of the tip. So, so I think the general concept holds that way. Yeah, that seems pretty interesting because uh, I think think about the coevolution of pollinators and yeah. plants from kind of the animals driving it, but it seems like the plant, maybe this yeah, you can't make the style longer is, than what you have a uh, bird with a beak or, uh, you know, to get in there to do. 
you know, to, to do the pollination. That's right. Yeah, Carl. So what you said at the very end that for some of the females, if they don't have a self-incompatibility system, the cross-pollen will grow faster, but eventually the self-pollen will get there. So they're essentially hedging their bet. It's a sort of best of both worlds. So why would a self-incompatibility system evolve if you have... Well, it's probably what we found our most, uh, where we found this most commonly was in plants that have close relatives that do have self-incompatibility systems, but they, but the literature says the self-incompatibility system has broken down, and that you can get self-pollinations and seed set from self-pollinations now. Now, but I really think it just changed to a handicapping system. Because it seems like for the female, it's the best of both worlds. If you yeah. got cross pollen, it's great. If there's no one around, you can pollinate yourself. Exactly. Exactly, and I, but I do think that these are uh, mostly in uh, uh, plants who have close relatives that that that, that, you, that have uh, incompatibility systems. But but I haven't done that to that many plants actually, that many species. Well, thank you very much.